four. Uh, we're starting verse number 21. Uh, we're we're going to do something. It's going to be real interesting today. We're going to finish 10 verses. See it out of the corner of my eye, wasn't enough. But, you know, there's only a few things. My wife thinks that nothing bothers me in the world at home. Uh, you know, when I like to leave my shoes in a certain spot. Like, I, I like to leave my shoes by, beside the door when you come in. Because I mainly, 98% of the time, wear Crocs. And. <laughs> You just can't ever tell when it's time to go. And she's like, nothing bothers me. Like you leave your junk laying all over the place. But that right there was proof that something has bothered me this morning. So, um, is everybody in here hot? <clears throat> Did y'all miss me last week? No, you didn't miss me. Dylan did a great job. Uh, I was like on the way home, I'm like, hey, man. Like, I don't. He was all up in that last week. It was really good. Like, really, really good. I, I wish I had been right here last week to hear. I, I know you did a great job. So, praise the Lord for that. All right, Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. <clears throat> Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? So, before we get way into this, <clears throat> before we get way into reading all these verses, make sure we understand where we have been. Paul is asking the question, Tell me, to the Galatians, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? It's kind of like, you know, you're saying you want to be under the law, but what I'm not understanding is that you, you're you saying you want to be under something that I know what it's like to be under. Maybe you have, maybe you're not hearing what I'm hearing when I hear the law. Does that make sense? So the Judaizers, is, is, is they came into Jerusalem, there and they got this deal going on. They're saying it's good, it's okay to be in Christ. But here's the thing, it's okay to be in Christ, but, you know, you still got to adhere to the law. There's still things that you've got to do in order to be right with God. And it, it is to say that Christ living inside of a man is not enough. It, it, it is to say that the blood of Jesus Christ is only work on Calvary. And the fact that the Holy Ghost made you his temple, that is not sufficient to be right with God. So here's all this other stuff you gotta do. You gotta be certain males, you, you gotta be circumcised. You gotta keep the law. You gotta, you gotta, as we learned a couple of weeks ago, they pulled down uh, the Pharisees in all of their madness and pulled down the, the, the whole law to like 300 and some commandments. And then they kind of pulled them down again. We've got all these things that we're trying to adhere to and ordinances that we're trying to adhere to. And, and, and they came in and they were saying, man, you've got to do all of these things if you're going to be right with God. And what Paul is saying, I hear you saying you want to be under the law, but what I, I don't understand is may, maybe you haven't heard the same, the same thing I've heard when I've read it. Like, I've read the law. I know what the law says. I know the law. I, you know, where Paul's at to be the guy he is, he would have had to have memorized the first five books of the Bible. The whole thing. And we're not talking about his 30s either. We're talking about as a young boy. Paul would have had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. So, so I, don't, I, I think that he knows what, what's going on here. Right? He's got the historical uh, uh, 
uh, application, I mean, reference here to understand historically, just from a, just from knowing the first five books of the Bible, what's up? Right? So he says, tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written, Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but of he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Uh, another in the Greek there, the rendering Hagar. Uh, verse 25 For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which is now, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou that bear, uh, thou bearest, that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now, we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise, but as then he was, uh, but then. As then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now, nevertheless, the scripture said, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Let's pray. Father, I, I pray uh, this morning, God, that Lord has is, is already been alluded to. I pray, God, that, that Lord, you work in this time of preaching. Thank you, Lord, for uh, for for the time we spent singing and, and worshiping you. Uh, Lord, I, I pray, God, that Lord, that our hearts were right toward you when we did that. Lord, now I pray, God, that our hearts will be right, and God, that, that we you'll be honored and you'll be glorified in all that we do and all that's said. Lord, I pray that. Bless what's going on here this morning, God, for, uh, Lord, for the fact, God, that for we know that there is but a little time, God, that, that, that we don't have long in, in terms of our understanding of, of the fact that you could come back, and, and Lord, very soon. And, and God, we don't want to waste our time, Lord. We don't want to waste what we have. So God, I pray, Lord, those in this room that are saved, Lord, that they would fix their hearts. They would fix their hearts towards the things of God. Lord, this morning we put away all the other things. Lord, I know, I know how hard it is, uh, Lord, to live a double-minded life. And God, I pray this morning that we wouldn't have people that live within a double-minded hearing, God, trying to do one thing on one side and one thing on the other. God, give us a focus for the things of God, and Lord, help us to understand the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, this morning, <clears throat> we're going to look at some contrasting. We're going to look and contrast some things that are coming out of these 10 verses. Uh, that, that, that I think is, or 11 verses, that I think are very profitable for all of us. Uh, number one, we're going to see, we're going to see Isaac versus Ishmael. Now, what are all these things going to show us? They're going to show us the law versus grace. They're going to show us the flesh versus uh, living in the flesh versus living in the grace of God, living in the spirit of God. Uh, we're going to see Isaac versus Ishmael. We're going to see Sarah versus Hagar. Mount Zion versus Mount Sinai. We're going to see the new Jerusalem versus an earthly Jerusalem. We're going to see a free woman versus a bond woman. Those born after the promise versus born after the uh, after the flesh. We're going to see the New Testament versus the Old Testament. The children of promise versus the children of bondage. Now we're going to put all these that we're going to see. We're going to put them in three different uh, three different things, if you would, three different contrasts, if you would. Uh, and then we'll make some practical application there at the end. <clears throat> what what we what we see in in terms of the very first contrast 
uh, the very first contrast Paul draws between real Christianity and legalism is the contrast between freedom and slavery. Freedom and slavery. One son of Abraham was born by a free woman and one was born by a bondwoman. Now, now what, what I want you to get, the real Christian life is marked by what? Is it marked by bondage or is it marked by freedom? Is it marked by bondage or is it marked by freedom? Freedom. Or you could say it depends on who you ask. You could say it depends on who you ask. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, there's probably some of you in this room that if you were to be honest, and I gave you a, a, a notepad and a piece of, I gave you a notepad and a, a pen, and I said, ask you that same question, it was going to be an anonymous thing, an anonymous thing. You, you might would say, what's well, bondage? This life is bondage to me. The Christian life is bondage to me. Maybe some teenagers in here can say, man, the Christian life is bondage to me. Let me, let, me, let, let, me, let me bring you down to reality for the adults, the teenagers, the children, everybody in between. If it's bondage, you're doing it wrong. If it's bondage, you're doing it wrong. And I dare say if it's bondage, you ain't doing it at all. If it's bondage and if it's work and if it's strife, then you're probably not doing it at all. Why? Because the real Christian life is not marked by bondage. It's marked by freedom. You see, you, you, you've, got one, you've got one child that's born after the flesh. Now, this is Ishmael. This is Abraham's son. But at the same time, this is the son of that is born after the flesh. Now, why why is this son born after the flesh? Now, we're not going to get, we, we could spend weeks just in these verses, but we're, we're not going to. I, I, I'll, I'll try to give you the best rundown and uh, the best uh, synopsis of what's going on that I can. Abraham and Sarah were promised a son. They were promised a son. God promised them a son. God promised them and said, look, I'm going I'm to make out of thee a great nation. I'm going to use you. God's going to use you. God is going to, man, great things are going to come from you, Abraham. And so as time goes on, Abraham gets, uh, gets impatient with God. He's getting older. Uh, Sarah's getting older. Sarah's getting impatient with God. And so what do they do? They, they come up with a way, their own way, to try and help God out. They, they, they try to help God out. And, and so what they do is they decide that they're going to get one of Abraham's uh, one, of, one of Abraham's handmaids, or, or, or Sarah's handmaids, and, and, and look, we're going to bring them two together in the bonds of matrimony. What's going to happen is, He's going to go in unto her. Why? Because God's late. God's not on time. And I'm impatient. And you said, God, you was going to do this. So, so here's what we need to do. We need to take Hagar. Now, now mind you, this is all Sarah's idea. And this is all the... the and, and then Abraham's following Sarah's plan. Now, you know, we're going to help God out. We're going to make God... We're going to... We're gonna we're gonna help God make a way, and so so Sarah says comes up this plan. That this this is what you're gonna do, Abraham. You're gonna go in and you're gonna be with Hagar, and you're gonna have me a child, and I'm gonna adopt this child. But the, how many of you understand that God does not need your help? God does not need your help. This is what God's trying to relay through the Spirit of God, through the mouth of the Apostle Paul, the churches in Galatia. God does not need your help. Why? Because every time you help God, you mess it up. Preacher, well, I just really think that I think you're being a little bit hard on this whole thing. I probably am. But do you know how many times I've messed up helping God? Do you know how many times I've messed up getting in front of God? Do you know how many times I've messed up thinking I was two steps ahead of God and I had a plan far out in front of God? Do you know how many times I've ended up in the train wreck of life because I tried to circumvent the will of God? 
Sometimes the will of God is patience. Abraham and Sarah said, man, we don't, we don't need a patience. We're getting old. The womb's drying up. Abraham, he's getting old and crotchety and, you know, all the stuff that comes along with old people. And, you know, they're, they're, they're thinking there's no way this is ever going to happen. They're thinking that, God, there's no way that when I'm old, and, 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 and I think it's uh, the book of it's Hebrew that says that she, was a, that, that she was as good as dead, that Abraham was as good as dead. That, that God had to get them to the place to where they was dead before God could ever bring to life what he was trying to bring to life. Well, you know, real Christianity, real Christianity and legalism is, is it, they're, they're two totally different sides. Why? Because one is freedom and one is slavery. Now, 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 now here's, here's oftentimes it doesn't look like it, but legalism is in fact just living after the flesh. That's all legalism is. How many of you ever heard, you've heard legalism, how many of you ever heard lasciviousness? Lasciviousness is living after the flesh. Now what, what independent, fundamental, King James only Baptist like to do, and, 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 and I like some of them. But what they like to do is they like to get over here on this side of legalism and put us in the bonds of our flesh the liberty of the Spirit of God that lives in every man, right? right. Okay. And, then, and then on this side, there's a whole nother avenue. We call this side the sea business. This is unbridled lust. This is to living in the flesh. It's wicked. It's it, it, it has, uh, uh, it's most of the time consumed with fornication. It's consumed with adultery. It's consumed with, you know, living after the thing is just an unbridled lust in terms of Whatever your, your flesh wants, that's what you're going to be. Now, now, here's what's crazy. This side looks wicked, and this side looks like it's really religious, and it's really spiritual. But the fact of the matter is, it's as wicked as the lasciviousness. Well, that just don't seem right. I mean, you know the only thing that is right. Is walking in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's the only thing that is right. But we 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 like to we like to doll it up, man. We like to put it on and, 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 and kind of like we like to make ourselves feel like we're more than what we actually are. You see, here's the deal: the 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 second that I, I I don't know did I put that that phrase on there by weird. I thought this was worth mentioning. Legalism does not mean the setting of spiritual standards. It means worshiping these standards and thinking we're so spiritual because we obey them. It also means judging others, uh, ju uh, judging other believers on the basis of these standards. Yeah. That's a pretty good quote. That kind of just sums everything that legalism really is. Up into a nutshell. So we got uh, we got one we got one child that is of the bond woman and it's by it's of the flesh and then we've got one child of a free woman and it's by promise. Right. Abraham's second son was named Isaac. He's he's born miraculously through Abraham's wife, the free woman, and and Isaac, Abraham's son, he, he's now the son of God's promise. And faith in God's miracle in the life of Abraham. This is what you got to get. God is not God. God is trying to circumvent you and me and our workings to come up and help God. Because God don't need no help. That ain't good English. It's good saying, man. God don't need no help. God don't need our help. God needs our submission. God doesn't want our help. God wants our submission. 
The second contrast, the second contrast Paul draws between Christianity and legalism is the contrast between a work done by God's promise miracle and a work done by the flesh. Now, real Christian, uh, real Christian life is connected to God's promise and not the flesh. Now, now notice this, verse 24, which things are an allegory, for these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. So, so he's, 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 he's comparing now, let, let me let me hit this just real quick. I won't, I won't be long right here. Uh, this this word allegory, uh, there is uh, there is in society now uh, a, a man stepped on the scene some early 1900s, and he developed a system called the allegorical method of interpretation, and whereby this man would take the Bible and he would. Uh, he would he would interpret the Bible from an allegorical standpoint, meaning that everything in the Bible, he was there to decipher whether it was an allegory or whether it was literal. Now you're in a church that that literally believes the Bible till we can't literally believe it anymore, right? Can we take the Bible literally? That's why we are that's why we are dispensationalists because we do. Take the Bible literally. Now, along with this idea of somebody coming in and saying, well, this is an allegory, that's an allegory, this is an allegory, that's an allegory, here's what you end up having. You end up having different Bible versions that have that have cut out Bible verses altogether. Just gone. Because this allegorical uh, method of interpretation that somebody come up with deemed that those verses should not be there based on the fact that was an allegory. And you're not talking about little things. I'm not going to go deep into that, but we're, we're not talking about little things. We're talking about big things. We're talking about salvation issues. We're not, we're not talking about little minuscule things. We're talking about things that really matter when people say, oh, that don't it don't matter if they take that out of the Bible. It don't matter if they change that in the Bible. It doesn't matter this. It doesn't matter, friend. It matters. It matters. It matters. Now, I think that the Spirit of God moving on the Apostle Paul, he had enough room within his own workings there to say, hey, this, hey, this is an allegory. And then not mess the whole Bible up. Right? So he says this is an allegory. And, and it's really just a comparison. It's really just a comparison and, and a parable to, to, to really bring to bring things from the past, set them in the future, and you draw right applications from them. So, so that's what he's doing. Which things are an allegory? There's two covenants. There's one from Mount Sinai. There's one from Mount Sinai, and then the other, the other is from Jerusalem. Make sure you get this. There, there's two covenants here. There's two covenants here. There's one covenant of the law, and then there's a covenant of grace in the New Testament. Now, now what, what, you, what you don't realize, now to make sure that we all understand what I'm talking about, with this whole two covenant thing, it's always been by faith in what God said. It's always been by faith. How did Abraham, how was Abraham right with God? It's always been by faith in what God said. Always. Well, just so happens, God changed up what he said. Remember that shift in the book of Acts? Remember that shift after the death of Christ in the book of Acts? We're, we're starting to shift now, and you're going to get in by grace. This is how you're going to get in. So, so it's two covenants. 
he's, he's laying it out that there's there's these two that there are these two covenants. And then the third contrast, I want you to look at this. The third contrast Paul draws between Christianity and legalism is the contrast between heaven and earth. Real Christianity comes from heaven, not earth. Real Christianity comes from heaven, not earth. The one, the one covenant, it gendereth bondage. The one covenant, it, it gendereth bondage. That remember, that's what it was all about. That's what the one covenant was about. The one covenant was there to bring us into bondage. Why? So that Jesus Christ could set us free. So that we could all see we were condemned under the law. Okay? One's now, we, we're, we're getting this, one's from Mount Sinai, one's from Mount Zion. One is from an earthly Jerusalem, one is from a new Jerusalem. Where's the new Jerusalem? It's, it's not here. Right? Okay? One's from a free woman, one's from a bond woman. Now, make, make sure you get this. Real Christianity comes from heaven and not earth. Paul wanted it to be understood as he used these pictures from the Old Testament. And he's referencing Hagar, he's referencing Ishmael. They were pictures and they were meant to illustrate that, that you and I, we, we are under the, the same bondage that they were under. They were, we're under the same bondage that they were under. They gendereth bondage. When we, before we came to Christ, we were under that kind of bondage. We were under all this stuff that we must do to be accepted by God. Now, what's crazy? Is that Sarah was going to have this, this child through Hagar. And she was going to adopt this child as her own to help God out. When God was trying to do the adopting, she stepped in and said she was going to do it for me. It, man, it's just crazy. When you think about the promise, the promise that was going to come through Isaac. Jesus Christ was going to adopt sons and daughters. And she is trying to mess up that adoption process by adopting a child to help God out. There's three things that I think every person in this room can see practically. That we can all see practically. That would really help us to get, that would really help us in our walk with Christ. Number one, what you're doing in the power of your flesh is the things that you're trying to get noticed for. What you're doing in the power of your flesh is the things that you're trying to get noticed for. Now, this is practically, I, I, I know that was a summarized view from a doctrinal standpoint, but we could be here for weeks if we really wanted to. And I, you know, I don't think none of us really want to camp out here for weeks. But three things that we can apply practically or devotionally from this text is this. What, what you're trying, what you're doing in the power of your flesh is the thing. So get with me in your mind. The things that you're doing in the power of your flesh are the things that you're trying to get noticed for. What was Abraham's and Sarah's? They're trying to get, they're trying to help God out. They're trying to get God to see them doing something to help him out. But what they don't realize is they're doing it in the power of their flesh. And God doesn't get glory. When it is, when it's in the power of our flesh. <laughs> he just don't, man. He don't get the glory that's due his name when we do it in the power of our flesh. Abraham and Sarah wanted it to go on record that they were just trying to help God out. 
Well, God, you know, I'm just I'm doing this for you. God, I'm just over here and I'm just doing it. And, and here's the thing. They did understand in their mind that this was all a big scheme that they came up with. And Abraham's supposed to be this big, strong, tall leader. You know, we're, we crucify Lot. Lot, Lot lumped in Sodom. He, he pitched his tent, scorched Sodom. And before it's over with, Lot's some kind of ruler in Sodom. And we all want to run Lot in the ground. And yeah, Lot lost his whole family. He, he paid his due, right? You want to live in the world, you're going to lose your whole family, friend. That's going to be the due you're going to pay. Why? Because what's our man saw, that shall he also reap. You're going to live in the world, you're going to pay. Period. End of story. It's just how it works. Lot paid his due. Lot ends up with the Moabites out of an ancestral relationship with a daughter that got him drunk and looked around and said, man, there ain't nobody else here. I'm going to get my dad drunk and I'm going to, you know. And so here the Moabites are. Lot paid his due. But what about, what about Abraham? What about Abraham when Sarah's coming by and says, hey, Abraham, I got you need to talk to you. So I got a plan. I got a plan. Put you on the plan. And you know, I mean, she, I don't know. I don't know if she came up all smiles. I don't know if she came up with a little twinkle in her eye, like, you know, man, Abraham, you know, why don't we, why don't we roast the goat tonight and Sit by the campfire. <laughs> I don't know what was that would be my idea of a romantic night in, in the plane. Let's roast the goat and sit by the campfire and watch the stars. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, there's no Netflix. Y'all realize that, right? <laughs> no TV. <laughs> you know, Abraham gets all buttered up and she says, Let me tell you something. You go in there and take it. And walk it up in there. And Abraham is so godly, he agrees. <laughs> Sound like a great plan to me. Where do I sign on the dotted line? So they come up with this plan to help God out. And they did it in the power of their flesh. And you know what I see? Not just, not just at our church, not just, I see it all over in churches all over the place. Ministries all over the place. People doing everything in their own power to be noticed by someone for something instead of just pleasing God by trusting his word and doing what they know is right and let the judgment seat of Christ sort it all out. Philippians 1 verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from, from, the, uh, from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. How about you know Romans 8 28 your gut? And we know all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the call according to his purpose. Instead of helping God out and trying to fix God's plans and trying to be noticed by men, why not? Yet within the, within the depths of our soul, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. I love this one. This helped me out in ministry years ago. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, guess what they're not? Somebody guess. They're not what? Friends. 
God said it wasn't wise to compare ourselves among ourselves. Why? Because God didn't call us to do that. God didn't call us to compare ourselves to each other. Verse 13 says, but we will not boast of the things without, without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God had, had distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you, for we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you, for we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel. Now here it is, verse 15, not boasting of the things without our measure, that is, of other men's labor, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not boast in another man's line of things made ready to our end, but he that glory, here it is, let him glory in the Lord. For not he, uh, for not he that commended himself is approved, but with whom the Lord what does it say? You know, it's a great day in my life where I, man, I quit trying to work for other men trying to bless me. Quit, quit trying to work for preaching places and, you know, and, and all that stuff. Friend, God don't need our help. God don't need our help. God don't need us running around trying to, uh, trying in the power of our flesh to, to, to get notice for certain things. No godly man, it's wicked. Do we spend more time? I, I wrote this down. I, just, I ask myself this at times. I have to ask myself this at times. Do I spend more time trying to be seen of men than asking the question, does this please my father? Does this please my father? Number two, number two, a house, excuse me, a divided house cannot stand. Some practically that I think we need to we need to look at from, from this portion of scripture. A divided house cannot stand. Jesus taught this to his disciples. He, Jesus taught this to his, to his disciples. In, in, in terms of a, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Where, where there's two opposing sides in a home, it cannot stand. That's why the husband and wife's roles are so important. Because in a home, when two opposing sides are there, they cannot, the home eventually crumbles, right? It happens the same way on the inside for you and me. Paul says that when the promised child and then the child of the flesh try to reign together, there's going to be conflict. So, so it was fine when, uh, when Ishmael and Hagar were in the house until the promised son was born. When the promised son was born, you got to get rid. You got to get rid of the other one. Why? Because they can't. They can't co-reign together. Why? Because we can't serve two masters. We're either going to love the one and hate the other, or we're going to hold to the one and hate that one and love the other one. Well, James 1 says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. 1 Kings 18, verse 21, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. A divided house cannot stand. Amos 3 says this, Can two walk together except they be agreed? God's saying this. Listen to me. God's saying, as long as the bondwoman, the flesh, is trying to cohabitate or co-reign with the spirit, the fight will be one that will soon, will 
but soon not see in very well. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? Did, did God, as long as the bondwoman, the flesh, and the promised son, and Sarah, try to cohabitate and co-reign together, the spirit, the spirit of God in the flesh, trying to cohabitate and co-reign together. Listen, it is a fight that cannot be won. Why can't it be won? Well, it goes like this. Sarah wants to raise her kids one way. Hagar wants to raise her kids another way. You got two moms in this house. And one wants to see her kids raised this way. One wants to see her kids raised this way. Hagar's going to raise her kids the way Rankins raised their kids. Sarah's going to raise her kids. When her and Abraham thinks kids should be raised. Are you trying to say that? Two different mothers here. There's two different places something's being born from. Remember, if, if, if you're in discipleship, you learn this: that when we're born, we're all child, we're all children of what? We're born, we're all what? Satan. We're all born into. We're all we're all lost. We're born into this thing, right? So, so, so that 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 is that is the first birth, our first birth. That's why we. That's why we need a new one. That's why we need a second birth, because our first one's jacked up, man. Amen. So we need another one. See, inside of you right now, there is two. There's the flesh and there's the spirit. You're here, you're saved, there's the flesh and there's the spirit. Don't you listen to me. A house divided cannot stand. You can't live in the flesh and try to live in the spirit. It'll never work. They don't co-reign real well together. <laughs> well, I'm going to do this on Sunday. And on Wednesday, and on Monday and Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and I'm going to live like hell. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to enjoy my life. I'm going to get on my phone. I'm going to look at stuff I'm not be looking at. I'm going to do stuff I'm not be doing. I'm going to think about stuff I'm not be thinking about. I'm going to say things I'm not be thinking. I'm not be saying. I'm going to let out of the abundance. Guess what you're doing? I'm going to let out of the abundance of my heart. My heart, the mouth. See, but I, I don't think this is as complicated as what we make it. We just don't like that mirror. We just don't like the stinking mirror. Why? Because it never lies. Out of the abundance of the heart, heart, the mouth, speaking. It should be. I know it's not easy. But it ain't because we don't know. You can't live two sides of this thing. And you can't live over here half the time and over here half the time because eventually this side's going to get this side. And if it don't get this side with lasciviousness, guess what it's going to get it with? And you're going to live over here. And maybe people living over here. And they live over here. And they live, in, they, they live out in... In the, in the world, and they do their thing, but when they come in here, they live real legalistic in terms of what, why? Because it can mask lasciviousness. Legalism can mask lasciviousness. You can live in a lascivious way all week in the world, but you come back over here and you can put on your face of legalism and you can almost make it look like you're spirit filled. We gotta be careful, man. We gotta be careful. And then number three, number three. Okay, we can play with that a little bit. Our, our desires are directly connected to what we hunger and thirst after. Billy used this verse last week. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. 
our desires are directly connected to whatever we hunger and thirst after. Are you tracking with me when I say that? Like our desires, our lives, our prayers, everything that we are in our being is tied to what's in our heart. You can tell a man's heart by what he invests in. You want to find out what you want to find out what's in a guy's heart? Get his check. Get his checkbook out. Where, see where he's been swapping that card, man. See how many debits the church has got on. See how many checks. I know checks are a foreign thing, but some of us still do that. See how many checks been wrote to to, to a church. To, to a mission, mission. See how many debits have been debited to, to a church? So, well, it's not the only place you can get. I, I, I get that. But I'm asking you a, a real life question. If, if I can go to your, if we, if we, we pull out your 20 year little handy dandy. And we pull up your your stewardship conference is coming up. I think this is just a good plug for it. We're pulling up, we're gonna pull up. Brother Curtis used to say time, talents, and treasure. Time, talents, and treasure. So we'll start with your time. Where are you investing your time at? And we got we got we're we're gonna look at your time, we're gonna we're going to debit out. We're going to, we're going to delegate out some time. Where's your time? Where's the most of your time spent? Where, where, where is a, a good portion of your time spent? It ain't got anything to do with the things of God. And it ain't got anything to do with prayer. It ain't got anything to do with Bible reading. It ain't got anything to do with the local church, the God instituted local church. It ain't got anything to do with discipleship. Guess what, Frank? That's a problem. Talent, we'll get talents. If it ain't. It, the thing, the talents are, are things that God's give you, gifts that God's give you, and, and, and you're not using them for the glory of God. These are all separate things. You're not using them for the glory of God. Now, that's a problem, right? Then we go, we go down to the treasures. Nobody, nobody likes this part. Let's go down to the treasures. We pull up that, we pull up that bank statement. We're looking, we're looking at that. We're looking at and, and, and there's, a, there's a little tip. God got a tip there. God got a tip there. But you know what? You know what it says? Chances are because where your treasure is, it's where your heart is. You can start at the bottom of that list and see why you're doing the top. Time, talent, treasure. Start at the bottom, and I can tell you why you're doing the top. You don't know me from Adam. Okay. All right. I've been around long enough to know this. Everybody, everybody comes to me and says, you, you don't know my heart. You don't know this. You don't know that. Defense mode is the it, defense mode. It's the greatest form of knowing you're wrong about what you're being accused of. I mean, straight up, you, 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 you know what I mean? Everybody gets all bowed up biblically. You know what the Bible says, Judge? You, know, you don't know me. I don't know you. I don't even matter. I ain't got to know you. Here's the deal. I'm not going to love you any less. And I'm not saying that. I'm not saying any of what I'm saying right now to try to get you to do any more than what you're doing right now. Not for me. Why? Because it's, it, if you did for me, it'd be the flesh. And guess what God don't bless? God don't bless the flesh. And I don't need you doing something in the flesh and God not blessing it even more and then you get frustrated six months down the road. Well, brother, I've been doing everything you told me to do. I, 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 don't put this off on me. Don't put this off on me. Well, you told me to do this, and you told me to do that. No, I give you the Bible verses, 
And I said, here's what God said. And if you want to do this, if you want to submit to what God said, then submit. If you don't, then keep rebelling. That's fine. But don't be, don't be mad when God can't bless you. Don't be mad when God can't let your two natures cohabitate together and be okay with trying to, your flesh sitting on the throne of your heart one day and the spirit trying to sit on the throne the next day. Don't get mad when God is understanding that you, you that, that this divided house is going to crumble eventually. Our desires are directly connected to what we hunger and thirst after. So I'm asking you, what do you hunger and thirst after? What do you desire? See, if you don't desire the Lord, if you don't desire the things of God, it's true. You're in a good place to start working through some of why you don't do that. It's a good thing. It's a good place for you to try to figure out, man, I, I don't know why I don't do that. I, you know, I don't know why I don't have this. I don't know why I don't have that. But it, it, it might just and it, it might just be you never actually submitted yourself to the things of God, to the will of God. Or, or just say, that's where I'd start. You know what I'd start? I'd start with, am I born again? Do I have the Spirit of God living inside of me? Has the Holy Ghost made me His temple? You tracking with me? That's where I'd start at. I'd start and I'd say, God, I need to read this one. That's where I'd start. God, Am I born again? And let God tell you. Don't let me tell you. Don't let some man. Let the Spirit of God bear witness with you. Let God convince you. Okay? You're born again. You say, man, I just don't have desire. I just don't have that desire right inside me. Brother Lord had a statement. And we use it all the time. Help me to thirst, Lord. Help me to thirst to be thirsty. Help me to hunger to be hungry. Help me to thirst to be thirsty. Help me to hunger to be hungry. God, I want to hunger and I want to thirst after the things of God. And Lord, if you don't initiate that, Hunger and that thirst, I'm afraid I'll never quench. Let's do this. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe, maybe you're you're in here. And You face some of these questions this morning. You're facing hell. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. You're facing these questions head on. And so I'm going to ask you. You say, I don't have that desire in me. I'm going to ask you. I want you to start in the first place. I would start. Are you saved? Are you born again? Are you born of heaven? Are you born of Jesus Christ? John 3 and verse 3 says, You must be born again. You must be born again. There's no other way around it. You say, man, dude, I'd like for you, I, and, I, and I, I'll just do this. I'll just pray for you this morning. You say, I'd like for you to pray for me. Just pray for me. I, I don't have any assurance of the new birth. I don't have any assurance I have been born again. And you're a great place for somebody to pray for you right now. Would you would you just you just slip your hand up low enough for me to see it? And I'm I promise I won't come to you. I just want to pray for you. Just slide it up, slide it right back down. Just real quick, right there, real quick. All right. So you get up, just slide it up, slide it right back down low enough for me to see it. Okay. You say, man, I know I'm born again, but I need that whole hunger to be hungry and thirst to be thirsty. I need that in my life. Lord, I need to start praying that prayer. God, help me to hunger to be hungry and thirst to 
be thirsty. Maybe that's the prayer you need. Maybe you've walked in the flesh so long that you forgot what it's like to, to live within the Spirit's mood and the Spirit's call. Brother Daniel, if you don't pray, if you don't say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to open these altars. If you want to come, come right in there. You've made an acknowledgement that if you die right now, you're, you're unsure. You don't have your own personal assurance of your salvation. Would you come settle that this morning? I mean, there's so many people, somebody in here, and you need that hunger to be hungry. You need that thirst to be thirsty. You're tired of doing things to be seen of men and not pleased by your father. I'm going to pray for you. Brother Daniel, if you don't sing, Father, we love you. Lord, we're grateful for the love of God that is extended to us first. God, I would know what love is had you not loved me first. And so, Lord, we're grateful. God, we're grateful for the grace of God that leads men to repentance. And I, I pray, God, right now, we take this time that we have, God, to honestly let us evaluate why we do what we do. God, why, why, why are we doing what we're doing? Are we like those Galatian believers that are that are, that are doing things to be seen, seen of men and pleased men? God, help us in here this morning. God, the one in here too may be lost. God, I, I pray. Lord, that you would convict, Lord, you would show them their need for a Savior in such a way, God, that you would move them to make a decision. God, that during this time, Lord, it would be, Lord, they would be, they would be moved. They would be moved to make a step in your direction. God, not knowing, Lord, all it takes is one. God, all it takes is one. So, Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that you uh, Lord, that you work in this time and you bless our time with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand right there? If you need to come, you can come on. Amen. Sinners so far from home, those that can change. I've heard all I've heard I've heard i i i Telling my story, power seeks, reaches where you are. And I pray the whole world here, cry in my heart. This is the all the ones I love, loving my Jesus. In Christ will make you high. Whispers that same old line. Call your pain inside. No one will understand. That's the small. I'm trying to be. Truth that has set me free. I'm just a broken man. Loving my Jesus. Showing my scars. Telling my story. How mercy reaches where you are. I pray that the whole world hears the cry of my heart. 